Hi, this is Ron at JSONAR, and uh, I figured I'd uh, upload a new video uh, because we have a lot to celebrate at JSONAR. We just released version 4.1, um, and more importantly, it's been uh, over four years since we first released Sonar G, and in fact, uh, just two weeks ago, we celebrated. Uh, the date at which the first Sonar G production uh, system, uh, the first system went into production a little over four years ago. Um, and at this point, if I count all of the different implementations for Sonar G and GBDI, um, Guardian Big Data Intelligence, there are currently, uh, according to my count, over 8,000 appliances being managed by Sonar G. So, certainly been a long ride um, and a very good one. Um, so, I figured I'd do this uh, a quick video since it's been a while and since uh, it kind of gives me the opportunity to explain what version 4 is all about, uh, kind of what the evolution of Sonar G has been, um, and also where it's going. Um, so the last four years have been pretty amazing. I think at this point there are hardly any large Guardium installations that are not using GBDI or Sonar G in production, and it's really become the de facto standard for Guardium deployments of any meaningful size. It's it's almost uh, uh, crazy to to try to manage a large large Guardium environment without GBDI or Sonar G. Um, and, and the two are practically the same, so you know, going forward I'll just call it Sonar G, but if you're a GBDI customer, it's really the, it's, all, it's all the same. Um, so we started uh, a long time ago, four years ago. Um, when we started, we thought that this was really about um, fixing aggregation problems and slow reporting. And so really the focus uh, for us back then was, you know, cost reduction and making a reporting system which was usable. And, and uh, when we started building this, we said, ah, you know what, this isn't that complicated. Let's just dump it into some relational database. Back then we thought we would, um, you know, choose something off the shelf. Uh, and we and we you know very quickly ruled out using a relational database because uh, I, you know we needed a flexible schema, uh, we needed something scalable, we needed something that would be very low cost, we needed something that uh, wouldn't require a DBA to manage it b because we just wanted to make things simple. Um, so we said, okay, it can't be a relational database. Then we tried Hadoop. That was even worse because Hadoop is so complex. Uh, so many services, so many problems. We said, okay, can't be that. And eventually we realized it's not going to be that simple, that we had to uh, do something which was really uh, tailor-made for Guardian. Um, and eventually we, we, we focused and used uh, a NoSQL data store. The, the reason for that was the simplicity of it and the scale of it, but we didn't. We 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 knew we couldn't take a shortcut, so we built something specific for Guardian, and it worked. We did it right. It took us a long time to do. It took us over over two years, uh, and we released it. And since then, everything's been 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 flying. Um, but when I look back, I realize that we were very naive four years ago. We really thought this was about fast reporting and aggregation. And even though that 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 was the value proposition at the beginning, um, we quickly realized as we worked with customers is that that's just not enough. This is this is you know certainly aggregation reporting was a big pain back then, but but really that's not enough. And the thing we kept hearing was. Um, you know, we're not getting enough value of the system, we invested so much money, we have such big teams running it, and the value is just not there. And, and, and so what is version 4 really about, and what have, what have the past four years uh, been about? Really about two things, okay? One is making your life simpler, and second is deriving much more value from your investment in, in Guardium. So the two are, are, of course, related because making your life easier means that 
uh, you can reduce costs, you can, you, can, you can do more with less people, and deriving more value is, is, is the other side of the coin. When, when, when people deployed Guardium a while ago, they had some expectations um, of what they were going to get from it. With Sonar-G or GBDI, you just get so much more from your existing investment. And I'll give you a few examples, okay? So, so let's start with, um, so I'll log into, into my system, which, by the way, interestingly enough, uh, this system on G2 has been around uh, since the beginning, meaning this system is over four years old, um, and it has never been rebooted, not once. Um, and w of course, it, it, it keeps getting an upgrade. We upgrade it every, every release. Um, but it's but it but it's the same system that's been around forever, and you know f from that perspective, I'll, I'll show you an example. If I go here and run a report and say that I want to do it from say uh, 2016, okay, um, till 2017, see all the data between 2016 and 2017, uh, you'll see that I'm getting records that that. Um, came in back, back, way back when, um, and and from that perspective, the the speed of the query is not reliant on how old the data is, or hardly reliant on how the data is, on how old the data is. Um, so so how do we make it easier? So the first thing is, you know, everything is in one place, right? So even if you have um, you, you can see here I have uh, quite a lot of queries in full SQL, and I have over 1.7 trillion policy violations. And so at different points in time, this system mimics getting data from somewhere between 200 collectors and 1,000 collectors. Um, and it's all in one place, doesn't matter how many self managers you have. Uh, it gives you a, a good... Um, a, g a good view into uh, where all the data is coming from. There's also an operational dashboard which shows you, you know, which collectors are sending data and how many STAPs are down and what are the top 10 collectors sending data and what type of data they're sending. Um, there's there's all these dashboards. There's 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 gap analysis which kind of shows you if, for example, you. Uh, uh, it, changed an operating system and because of the operating system some some kernel modules not loading that will be immediately flagged on the system because we'll notice from an analytic perspective that the traffic is looking different so all these things are there to help 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 make your life easier but one of the things that that we did early on with sonar g um, and it's become more and more uh, important is this notion of self-service so rather than you having to uh, produce all the reports. All the reports are here. All the reports you're used to are here, whether they're on sessions, on queries, on, on exceptions, they're all here. But it's not up to you to necessarily give everybody access to the system so you're not overloaded with work. And the way that you can access the system is, is pretty much any GUI that's out there. So, you know, you can open up as an example, you can open up uh, uh, Sonar K, which is the main tool that we use for um, for letting people see the data. Uh, so, for example, if I want to look at session information, I can just pick this index, uh, set the time frame. Let's say I want to look at it not the last 15 minutes, but the last 15 uh, weeks worth of data. So I run it, it. It it runs a query. It gives me all my sessions. I can I can uh, very quickly drill down on this time frame. I can then look at uh, any of these and start producing things. So I can say, you know, for example, show me where all the client host names, where uh, these sessions are being produced from. It'll go. It'll it'll count how many there are. It'll sort it by the number, and it'll show me. Okay, most of them are coming from this. Uh, AWS instance, but some of them are coming from this IP, so I can now drill down and only show it from this IP. So it's a very, very uh, convenient environment. You can give it to anybody. You don't have to teach them anything. You don't have to teach them about the Guardian data model. Um, 
it's just very very simple it is just one of the UIs um, and you know since since I am taking a little bit of a walk down memory lane uh, I you know I pulled out some screenshots from the very first version of of uh, sonar G um, just just shows you how far we've evolved over the last four years so this was the original uh, kind of facet viewer um, you can see it was much more primitive uh, much much uh, much more technical at this point it everything is so intuitive uh, you can really give it to anybody um, and the same thing goes for dashboards right I mean if you want to look at all kinds of errors in the systems that are errors in your databases that map into uh, Guardian exceptions you know there's a dashboard for that it'll show you that this is actually showing all exceptions some of this data is coming from Guardian like for example the all the DB2 traffic is coming from Guardian but for example MongoDB Atlas uh, we have a native integration with MongoDB Atlas or AWS RDS instances those are uh, th those are using uh, cloud connectors versus using Guardian. So um, all in one place, all very convenient, all very intuitive, but the whole self-service approach is, is, is bigger than that because different users will be comfortable with different UIs. So for example, if your SOC uh, people are more comfortable with, with Splunk, they can go into the Splunk GUI, they can pick what we call a virtual index, um, and they can run the query directly from here and what this does is this isn't data that we have sent over to Splunk to be indexed although of course that's also possible but this is data that's still living within SonarG that you can use the Splunk GUI in order to access so I can see everything you know directly from here even though the query is occurring on on SonarG the Splunk user is oblivious to that and can just be comfortable with their UI. Uh, similarly, if you have some auditors and or business, you know, more business oriented people and they're comfortable with Tableau or any other BI tool, um, again, you can do the whole thing from Tableau. I can connect, I can connect using Tableau. Tableau is connecting into SonarG as a native, uh, as a native source. I can pick which data set I want to to look at and inspect or build a dashboard on or whatnot uh, and and this is true for any data that exists within sonar G not just you know the queries and the sessions and the exceptions in this case maybe I want to look at VA data um, and I want to see where all, all my vulnerabilities are and how many vulnerabilities do I have and perhaps even um, I don't know what the severity is per host that has vulnerabilities. Again, very intuitive because the user uh, can use whatever they're comfortable with. So that's a self-service example of how we make things easier for you. Uh, the centralized reporting for all Guardian environments is another area that we make things easy. Uh, extended retention is something we make very easy so for example you see all of this data which is quite a lot of data since it's been around for for over four years um, the way the system works is it optimizes the retention so if you're if you need to comply with New York DFS and you need to hold data for three years rather than have uh, all of these archive files that the different appliances produce and you have to save them somewhere and if you ever need to look at it you have to start restoring these things that, that that's just a nightmare instead what you do is every, all the data from all the appliances all flow into sonar G and then within sonar G you create a retention policy and the retention policy is something that could differ depending on if you're running this in the cloud or if you're running this on-prem um, both of them are, are, are easy in the same way. Uh, they just use different uh, optimization or, or, or optimized storage depending on where you are. So for example, if I'm running this in the cloud, if I want to run this in the cloud, um, you know, I can pick, uh, say that I run this on AWS, I can say that I want to keep uh, like six months of it locally but then the rest I want to use I want to use cloud storage so I'll set 
uh, one year on cold storage, another year on offline storage, and then I'll purge it. And it's as simple as that. Um, and so, for example, if I look at these policy violations that I have, um, 1.7 trillion of them, you know, I don't want to waste expensive expensive storage on on that. So, so what you can see is, you know, locally I'm only holding uh, six gigs of this, and the rest I'm uploading into the cloud. So then I can I can have um, very cheap storage without having to manage it. So 47 terabytes of these policy violations are uploaded to the cloud. Um, and so again, it's a way to simplify things. Uh, another example of how we simplify things is is just making uh, everything simple. So even though um, you know you you could have a lot of Guardium, you could also have perhaps a little bit of Imperva. Maybe you have some Oracle Exadata that 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 you need to do uh, without agents. Maybe you have uh, cloud environments that that you can't use agents for. for this is kind of the new heterogeneous, and for us, um, this is really what it's all about. So you know, you you can funnel Guardium in. That's really simple. Maybe that's 80% of your environment, but but maybe maybe instead of holding some environments to the side, um, you can use the system. You can look at uh, you know you you can funnel also anything that maybe some business unit that you have using Imperva and normalize it all, all to the same model. So for example, uh, if I look at this uh, at this dashboard, this dashboard is showing me the data that's coming in from non-Guardium sources. Um, you know, some of them could be could be cloud, some of them could be could be uh, could be other uh, damn systems, but again for from from a simplification perspective it's all very very simple this notion of supporting you know what the industry is now calling hybrid cloud is not just lip service it's real uh, and and it's real it's in production you, so you can see here you know i have data coming in from mongodb atlas from rds various flavors uh, from gcp bigquery uh, from redshift from snowflake Everything is in one place. Everything is normalized. Everything is simplified. Only one set of reports. Only one set of dashboards. Only one set of policies. Very, very simple to do. And then finally, another a, another way that we're simplifying things is we also offer this as a SaaS. So if you go, for example, to DBSec2, you'll see that you can get this as a managed service. You don't have to stand up any machines. You don't have to do anything. What you do is you subscribe to a plan. The plan could be cloud only, or cloud plus native audit, or cloud plus Guardian, or cloud plus Guardian and Imperva. You just subscribe to this. And at that point, we do everything. We stand up the system. Uh, if you have things on-prem, we connect a single gateway that collects all this data from the different sources, uploads it into the same place. Um, and then this this is a managed service. You don't you don't do anything except become users of the system. You can produce your reports. Uh, you can get them sent to you. You can use the workflow. But really, very very simple. So these are all examples of um, simplifying things. And I'll give you a few examples also of deriving way way more value out of your existing investment. So I think at the beginning. A lot of these uh, database security projects, even though they were called database security, database protection, really were focused on um, on on compliance. And the idea was, okay, we'll put this in, get a bunch of compliance reports, check the box, and you're done. But over time, you know, you, you know that was good ten years ago. At, at some point, somebody starts asking the questions. Well, we invested all this money, and we have such a team why are we not also deriving some security uh, benefits from this? And this and this is something we started seeing uh, many years ago and we started investing in this about uh, four years ago, but it took us time to build. Um, at some point we introduced the concept of UBAs, uh, User and Entity Behavioral Analytics for 
uh, Guardium and database activity. And at this point, whenever you deploy SonarG, one of the main things you get is this thing called threat, the threat dashboard and the threat models. And so what we do is we package 16 threat models which, which, which really cover the spectrum of what a typical attack on a database looks like. There are different uh, threat vectors. The, th the vectors are composed of models, so each one of these is a model, machine takeover, service account abuse, suspicious grants, SQL injection, dormant users. Those are all models that are, that are pre-packaged with the system. Uh, each each model has an attack vector, so you know SQL injection is part of the code injection attack vector, um, and machine takeover propagation is part of account compromise. But account compromise could have other models as part of it. So you get a view into uh, all your attacks, how many there are, where, where how they're evolving, how bad they become. Uh, you can see here that it got really bad, but then somebody fixed something, so it went down. And, and, and really, in a single place, be able to manage everything, be able to drill down um, and say, you know, I, I want to look only at this model, and then I want to look at the details of, of, of what is happening, why this is being flagged. And you get all of the information in one place. So if this is a code injection, you get exactly what was flagged as the code injection issue. And again, this is exactly the same view that the people in your in your SOC within the Splunk GUI will look at exactly the same data. And these and these UBAs are things that come with the system, so they all are here. So the account abuse. Uh, attack vector includes things like excessive connections, excessive data extrusion, excessive data modification, uh, non-standard access time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All things that that uh, not only make your life easier, but more importantly, make your system a security system, not just a compliance system. And similarly, some of the some of the ways with that you identify. Um, that there is that there is a, a an issue as you compare behaviors of users to their peer groups. So that's also something in the system with a bunch of machine learning classifiers. Um, another example is is the fact that the system has a built-in workflow system, um, all part of of uh, any SonarG implementation. And anytime somebody implements SonarG, they are very heavily very heavy users of uh, of the workflow system, and what the workflow system gives them is 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 the ability to get away from these email-based and manual processes. So whether it's a reconciliation uh, workflow, um, you know, they would use this. They would go in here. They would see what they need to approve or reconcile. Uh, they would get automatically the data from CyberArk or ServiceNow attached to these tickets. Uh, they would then start work on this, and they would decide what they want to do, and and the whole system is configurable. So, um, you know, here it says, when I'm in the open states, I can justify this to the manager. The reason this happens is that you can see that um, depending on where who I am and what the transitions are from the open state, I can go to the manager review using the to justify to manager action. So, so those are those are all things that that are pre-built with the system, but that you can tailor it uh, to your own. So you can both cut down on resources and reduce risk by removing all of these manual processes. And this is true for uh, audit data. This is true for security data. This is true for vulnerability assessment data. And this is true for sensitive data management. So if you're you have a sensitive data project where you're scanning systems and somebody needs to go and check it. Uh, these are all things that, that you can do within the system. So you can get the results of the classification scans. You can route it automatically to the, your owner. Um, they can mark they can they can mark if this is a false positive or they can go and check it. Um, so these are all things part of the system. And then the workflows themselves are also connected to things that we call playbooks. So playbooks are uh, come into play, especially with uh, security events. So, okay, we identified a threat. Then now the question is, what do you do with the threat? So 
Uh, in 4.1, you have a notion of playbooks. A playbook is a sequence of operations that are automated and usually orchestrate um, a, a certain response uh, involving multiple systems. So maybe it involves doing something at the Guardian level using the Guard API, but maybe it involves doing something at the AWS level uh, using IAM, for example. And these are all built into the system and automated. So it's true uh, even if I go, you know, it's true everywhere. It's true in the workflow. It's true in automated processes. And it's also true in, in, in these threats. If I go in here and I see a threat over here, if it's relevant, then I'll have a certain playbook. Um, and that playbook in this case is the lock user playbook and the way the, the, the lock user playbook works. If I look at it, um, you'll see what it does is it loads the asset. The asset could be a database that Guardian controls and it could be a database controlled by AWS IAM and it could be a database on Azure controlled by uh, Azure's Active Directory and so each one of these systems may have a different secrets management system tied to it on on how do you log into the database in order to lock a user but that's what this playbook does and if I look at uh, a certain run of a playbook you can see down here it will always describe what exactly it did so it loaded the asset and the asset in this case was a an RDS instance so you can see it loaded the RDS it that went to load um, it needed some permission in IAM because it, it had to connect to this instance and then it called the lock user action you can see the actual result at the end is over here this is the message that came back from this MySQL database running on RDS that says user Luigi was locked on this server so the whole thing is automated and you get true security response using these playbooks um, and these playbooks can be attached to a Yuba. So for example, if I say over here, if I want to modify one of my, if I want to automate the, the response to something that's being identified by the system, I can do that. I can say that upon a certain, um, a certain issue, I can have uh, alerts that go out and alerts uh, could be one of three things. It could be an email, it could be a workflow ticket that gets created, or it could be going by syslog to something like uh, like Splunk or some other sim. However, I can also attach a playbook to it. So down here I can attach uh, a playbook so that if something happens and I and I trust my models enough, I can automat automate the response to this and not have to rely on somebody um, so it's kind of taking it from a detective control to a preventive control in a very simple way and also address the fact that not everybody um, has the know-how and skill set. So even if you send things to the, to the SOC, having the playbooks in there is really important because you know the SOC people are, are very often generalists. They may not know enough about the database, but if you tell them, okay, if these things happen, your options are either run this playbook or this playbook, then you know they'll learn this very quickly and so you can elevate the, the benefit that you get. Um, so I don't want to take too much time. Hopefully you, you get the sense of where we started and where we're going. Um, this is, you know, SonarG and GBDI have become uh, a kind of the way that you make uh, Guardian deployments what you I think uh, most people intended them to be in the first place. Uh, certainly getting a lot more value of it. Um, certainly the GUI has changed a lot in over the past four years. I, I, I pulled out the first, uh, the first ever uh, Sonar G screen. Really all it was is a place to dump the data and then a few reports. You see we had reports for sessions, queries, full SQL, exceptions. Um, and, and by the way, all these are still here, right? These, like if I look at these uh, six, they're all in here. They're in, uh, you know, they're in uh, the session reports and the query reports, the exception reports, but there's way more than that. Uh, there are analytic type reports. You know, for example, if I go to uh, SQL error offenders and I do an analysis to show me uh, everything since 
the beginning of July, so I'm not going to get a stupid report of just a bunch of lines, uh, because usually that will include uh, 20 million lines. What 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 this is going to do is it's going to do some uh, crunching and slicing and dicing, and it's going to give me a result of everything that's been going on in the last three months from an exception perspective for my entire environment but in a way that I can do something with it so instead of giving me you can see this is this is a 25 million exceptions okay I don't want to see 25 million exceptions but I do want to see one row that says if I address these things just things that are going to this server with within this instance um, I have all of these errors happening and it gives me the exact breakdown of which database user from which OS user from which client generated which so so three of the 25 million were generated by this connection and it gives it to me in a consistent way some of it connected from Guardian some of it coming from Snowflake some of it coming from uh, MariaDB so everything is really simple so certainly you have all of the simple reports but the whole idea is to make the system uh, way easier to use and and producing much much higher value from it so thank you uh, hopefully you're part of this journey with us uh, that started four years ago um, you know I, I did a quick count earlier this year uh, and we s somewhere kind of uh, in the first half of this year we got uh, to approximately 8,000 appliances under management uh, throughout the different implementations. I'm pretty sure that by the end of the year we'll hit the 10,000 mark. And so it's a very exciting journey. I think it's pretty clear at this point that um, let's say three years from now there's not going to be any Guardian system with over 10 collectors. It's not going to have a Sonar G right next to it. Um, and so, you know, thank you for being part of this journey and uh, uh, see you when we release version 5. Thanks.